hey, as much as we like to celebrate that Jesus rose again from the dead, uh, I read an article recently that was a bit disturbing. I, I, I read it the other day. It was on the eve of Good Friday uh, from the Associated Press. Uh, a, a reporter was in Jerusalem, and I, and I wanted to read the article to you. Uh, wanted, it's on the Associated Press in Jerusalem, Israel. On the eve of the annual celebration, I'm going to read it to you. On the eve, on the annual celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the one million inhabitants of the city were shocked at the announcement that a body identified that of Jesus was found in a long neglected tomb just outside the boundary of the city. Rumors have been circulating last week that a very important discovery was about to be announced. The news, however, far outstrips all of our wildest guesses. The initial reactions of Christians here and around the world has been one of astonishment, bewilderment, and defensive disbelief, which is what I would consider myself. We will have to wait and see just what effect this discovery will have on the 2,000-year-old religion. Now, the author goes, To the mind of this unbelieving writer, it appears that Christianity will have to take its place on the same level with other religions of the world. No longer can followers claim that unlike the other religions, the tomb of its founder was empty. Evidently, a 2,000-year-old lie has come to an end. Now, when I read that, I knew that was fake news. That's fake news. There's no such, there's no such report, everybody, okay? Can I hear an amen? amen? Boy, you guys are like... All right, let me explain. If Jesus did not rise from the dead then what we're doing here today is a complete waste of time, and I would not be here. The Apostle Paul, Paul said, we're the sorriest group around. That's my paraphrase. If, we, if, if Christ did not raise from, was not raised from the dead, you're still in your sins, and there's no hope. We might as well drink, eat, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But Christ has been risen from the dead. We believe he rose again from the dead. In fact, that's why we're here. Absolutely believe that. And so I want to encourage you today, whatever you're going through, know that Christ is here and he's closer than you think. And, and one time, sometimes what happens, everybody, sometimes people tell you and they try to sell you Christianity and they try to gloss over the reality of life. You know what? We are living in a time that is difficult. And if anyone tells you, give your life to Jesus, it's all going to be perfect. That is true ultimately. But in this world, Jesus said you will have trouble. Now, I, I pause to bring this story up to you because I don't want to bring up negative negativity, but you know what? We live in a negative world, but we serve a positive Savior. But I wanted to share with you what has happened this past week. Uh, one of our dear friends, Dr. Franco, who we're praying will come on our, our staff as a missions pastor. He was uh, born and raised in, in Haiti, and he became a doctor from an orphanage. It's a great testimony. This past week, his sister-in-law, his wife, sister was driving a vehicle she has a five-year-old son and she has a husband who's dying of cancer okay not a good situation she's driving home at night on tuesday night and all of a sudden a drunk driver hit her from the behind knocked her out of her lane she came to an oncoming traffic her car burst into flames and she was burned to death and she leaves behind her son who's five years old and a husband who's dying of cancer, and a mother who's got health complications. Dr. Franco and his wife are devastated, as you can imagine. And he says, I know God is watching over the situation. I don't understand it. Now, why am I bringing this up on Easter? Because we live in a real world with real pain. And some of you are going through pain. You're asking God, why am I going through this? And even Dr. Franco said, Pastor, I know God is with us. I don't understand this. Sometimes there's a mystery of life. Why do we go through the pain? But I know this. He's closer than you think. Even his sister who knows Jesus Christ knows that. And so I want to take a moment right now. And I want to pray for Dr. Franco and his family. I want to pray for that five-year-old book. Can we take a moment right now, everybody? So Lord Jesus, we thank you. You're the God of new beginnings. Lord, we don't understand why this event took place. Lord, but we're asking for your mercy. We're asking for your grace. We ask that for this five-year-old boy would know that he's loved by you. Lord, we ask even as a church, Lord, as we, as we gather around Dr. Franco and his family during this horrible season, we're asking that Cornerstone would be an island of refuge and hope and provision for this family during this difficult time. And Father, we are praying especially for that five-year-old boy. Lord, that he would know you, he would love you, he would come to be a mighty man of God one day despite these horrible beginnings that he's experiencing of loss in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Now, I bring that up because maybe some of you are going through stuff. Maybe not as bad, but maybe pretty bad. Maybe you've been diagnosed with something. Maybe you lost a mother or father or a child. Maybe you're, you're, you're in the pains of divorce right now. You're going to court right now. Maybe you're ready to serve your spouse papers. Or maybe you were trying to get into university and you didn't get into it. You lost that, that dream job. Maybe that relationship, you thought she or he was the one, and it's dashed to the rocks. Maybe you thought you, I've been good for all many, so many years. I beat this addiction, and you fall prey to it. Maybe even on the way to church, you had a horrible argument, and you're like, why do we even bother going to church? We're a bunch of hypocrites. Welcome to the club. And I tell people this all the time. This is true. If you think this is a perfect church, do do us a favor. Run out as fast as you can before you ruin it. There is no perfect church. There's only a perfect Savior. So I want to be honest with you and real with you and know that in this world you're going to have trouble. But Jesus is closer than you think. We don't know everything. We think we know things. And we tend to see what we focus upon. We tend to see what we focus upon. Let me give an example of what happens, okay? Uh, We often see what we focus upon. For example, now I'm going to be very, I'm going to to preface this. I don't want anyone canceling me, okay? Uh, We, okay, I want to ask you a question. Do you see a beautiful hag, an older woman that's a hag, beautiful hag, or do you see a younger woman? Which one do you guys see? How many see the old woman? Okay, this is, the, this is the more biblical crowd. How many of you see the, the young woman? Okay. Okay, so you guys are more positive. The other services, they saw the negative. And actually, it's not negative. We like the old hag, right? Beautiful old hag. Okay, here she is. Here's her, here's her chin. You see that? There's her mouth. There's her big nose. I'm sorry. Her nose. There's her eyes, right? And there's her hair. Okay, there's the old woman. You see her now? Okay. Or do you see the young woman who is as equal in value and beauty to this other one, okay? Right, guys? We can't say anything else or we'll be canceled. Okay, so here's her chin, here's her nose, here's her eyes. So which one do you see? It's what you focus upon. How about this one? How many grew up in the Pentecostal church? I can say this because we're Pentecostal, okay? You ever hear the Pentecostal bun? You grow your hair out long, you put it up in a bun. You know what we call that? Bondage. Anyhow, so... Here we have a, a bondage over here. It looks like almost like uh, the Simpsons here. So you, what do you see? Do you see two silhouettes of women or do you see pillars? What do you see? You guys are fickled. You don't know which one you are. No. Uh, you look here, you'll see the pillars, right? But if you focus on this, you'll see that. It's what you focus upon, you will see, and you will drive towards. That's why it's very important what we place our eyes upon. Sometimes we're in the middle of a going through a difficult time. All you can see is the bad things that are taking place. As a result of that, we can find ourselves driving to the very thing we're trying to avoid because of the pain we're experiencing. What do you focus on is what you often see. And during Easter was an amazing time. We're going to share a few moments about that. Now, let me ask you another question. How many of you see a duck? Okay, you guys are more biblical. How many of you see a bunny? Okay, you guys are pagans. Because (laughs) Easter is not about bunnies. It's about, not ducks, it's about Jesus. Okay, so... (laughs) Here's the eye, here's the bunny, here's the ears, or it's a duck. Which one is it? It's what you see, it's what you focus upon. They're called optical illusions. And often we have a a different image of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, When I say Jesus to you, what do you think in your mind? I hear people say all the time, well, my Jesus does this. My Jesus says this. And I find that Jesus, according to what I see around our culture today, is a little bit schizophrenic. Because one moment he says things and he says another. People kind of make their own Jesuses up in their minds. But how many folks know there's only one Jesus? And so we have different views of who Jesus is. I wanted to show you a picture that I grew up with. How many like, who's this? Is it really? Okay. I grew up with this picture. Warner Salmon was born in 1815, died in 1968. A good year, by the way. I'm not going to tell you the reason why. Uh, but he, he drew this picture, or he painted this picture. It has become the most popular picture in Western culture. There's over 500 million of these things floating around the world in different places. In fact, I had this picture on the, my bedroom wall next to my bed where, my, where I turned my face. It was a glow-in-the-dark one of these. So I literally would put the light on, and so at night I could see. You know why? I used to have nightmares because my brother David. 
My brother David, who Pastor Tom knows in the back there, he's seven years older than me. He was a bully, all right? And we used to watch this program, and I used to live in Long Island, New York. By the way, it's Long Island, not Long Island. I've never heard a Long Islander ever say Long Island. The only one that say Long Island are people not from Long Island. Just want to let you know that, okay? So there was this program called Chiller Theater. And it would be on on WPIX to show these horror films. They were kind of like, you know, Dracula. But in the, in the beginning credits, it would like this. And the guy had six fingers. It freaked me out. I was so scared. I had nightmares. So I got this Jesus, and I put a flashlight on him, and I got him all glowed up so I could handle the night. A lot of people have an idea what Jesus looks like. But they'd had some forensic for, for scientists that went around in the area of Israel and they went to all these tombs and they collected a bunch of male skulls of the time of Christ. And they did three-day computer scans upon them. They put them all together and then they built the face uh, based upon fat tone and, and, and flesh and tried to figure out what Jesus more than likely looked like rather than this. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with this. He's got blue eyes, which Jesus probably didn't have, and he has a mullet. Fitness in front, party in the back, right? But this is not what Jesus looked like. He wasn't anorexic like this. And this is what they came up with. Okay, I'm not saying this is Jesus, but this is what they think. Now, just before, I know you guys are going to take pictures of that and put it on your wall. Uh, <laughs> Jesus probably looked more like this guy. A bigger nose, right? That's why big noses are godly, all right? Brown eyes, and he probably was uh, probably about five foot three to five foot seven, not like me, six foot three. I am over six foot three. I'm on the stage. So this is what they actually thought he might look more like, which is more accurate. We have these pictures of Jesus in our lives, but he's closer than you think. We don't always recognize him. There was a gentleman that was playing in the subways of, of Washington, D.C. in 1997. This guy came out. We had a, he had a Nationals baseball cap on, which is a baseball team. He had a jersey on, and he had a violin, and he opened it up and put some money in there so people could give change. And he began to play in the bottom of the subway by a dumpster. And he played for 35 minutes, and he had a crowd of two or three people. That's it. Hundreds of people were passing him by, not paying much attention. And he gathered $35 in that period of time. The interesting thing is, that violin player was someone very famous that no one knew about. He was disguised. Well, not to him. <laughs> it was Joshua Bell. Joshua Bell is one of the most world-renowned violinists in the world. He plays a Stradivarius that's worth over $3 million. It was stolen twice. And he did it as an experiment. He put on this, and the Washington Post reporter did this thing, and he was playing violin, playing Bach, one of the most beautiful music ever created in humanity. He was playing that. If you don't think so, you're not as sophisticated like me. Anyhow, so what the article said was this. With the greatest violinist in the world playing the best music ever written, on the most expensive violin, get anyone's attention at all? And the resounding answer is not really. You see, Jesus is closer than you think. You may not realize it. In fact, right now, some of you are close to a blessing. You're close to being getting something that will help you buy things in this world. You, in fact, I'm going to tell you right now, some of you are close to beverages that will make you happy. I'm going to ask my two friends to stand up, please. Where are my two friends? There's one. And where's the other one? Pastor Randy, where are you? Oh, there you are. My two friends. Right? Okay. Now, I, I, over here, the gentleman that's in front of you with the red shirt, okay, keep him the gift card. Starbucks. There you go, my friend. Closer than you think. There are blessings closer than you think. Now, where's the other one? There you are. Okay. I'm going to ask the, the woman in front of you. You are blessed. I hope you like Starbucks. Give it to her. Right there. Yep, the one with the girl on the left. There you go. Congratulations. Come on, give him a hand. Now, they didn't know a few moments ago that they had $25 in their pocket to go to Starbucks and get one drink. <laughs> did, they, did, they, did they know that? No, that's closer than you think. You don't always realize that God's blessings are right around you. In fact, we're going to look at a story right now, one of the most famous stories in the Bible found in the book of Luke and the day Jesus rose from the dead. And Luke is a reporter who took uh, careful notes and came together with this gospel we call Luke. And he's talking on perhaps one of the most beautiful stories in Scripture about two disciples of Jesus, not the 12, but probably the 70 or maybe the 120 or maybe the 500 people that were following Christ 
at a distance, not as close as the original 12, and they were devastated what happened. If you're not familiar with the story, Jesus died on Friday during Passover, and he, they, he was crucified, he died, they put him in a tomb. And then Easter morning, some people came to the tomb and said, he's alive. And so these guys are now on a walk, or like we would say, a drive. So here we go, Luke 24, verse 13. That very day, which is Easter in the afternoon, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus. Now, I want you to hold on to that for a moment. We're going to talk about Emmaus in a little bit. Emmaus was a place of hot springs. About seven miles from Jerusalem, they're on a, on a walk to Emmaus. And at seven hour, seven miles would be about two and a half to three and a half hours or more. If you're walking fast, about two and a half hours. If you're walking slow, probably about three and a half hours or so to get to where they're going. It's a pretty long journey. You get to talk to someone. And by the way, they didn't have these things to distract them. They could actually have a conversation. I had no commentary on that. Okay, seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. What things that had happened? While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself. Ah, look, it's Jesus. Nope. What happened? Jesus himself drew near, and they went. he went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. They didn't know that Jesus was walking with them at the time, at the very height of their pain and disappointment and discouragement and depression and anxiety and giving it all to the wind. We sold everything. We followed this guy. Everything we went to live for, and now we're disappointed. And right with them is Jesus walking with them. Now, why didn't they recognize him? The Bible says it was kept from their eyes. What does that mean? I don't know, but I, could it be perhaps that their eyes were on the failure? Maybe you can't see God's blessing because you're seeing the failure and the sickness and the difficulty that you're experiencing. Maybe you can't see God because of the anxiety and the depression you can't seem to shake off. Does God really love me? Why is he allowing me going through this? And so they're walking along the way and they don't see Jesus, but guess what? Jesus sees them. And Jesus sees you where you are today. He knows your pain. He knows what you're going through. He knows everything about you. He knows every hair follicle on your head, or like me, who are losing them. He knows about that too. He knows everything about you. And he loves you. And so they're walking along this, this path. And maybe you're walking along the, the, the pathway of life, wondering what God has for you. But their eyes were kept from seeing him. And he said to them, which is so interesting, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? You know, Jesus cares about what you think. He cares about your heart. In fact, there are often times where I'll, I'll hear the Lord's voice. I don't literally hear God's voice like audibly like this, but sometimes I'll be worried. I hear God say, why are you worried about that? I got this thing, man. Why are you worried about it? I, I see what you're going through. Don't worry about it. I got this thing. And maybe you're wondering, Jesus, do you even understand what I'm going through? God cares about your heart. In fact, at a very uh, time of great suffering, his friend Lazarus, who about a week and a half before this died, and Jesus rose him from the dead. But before he did that, he went to the funeral, if you will, and people were crying. And Jesus, the shortest verse in the Bible says, Jesus wept, even though he knew within 20 minutes from that time, he would raise him from the dead. But he cares about your heart. For example, do you know I cried over a rat one time? Not a rat, a gerbil. My daughter, Hannah, I don't like rodents. I don't like them at all. Ask Janine, anyone in the office, there's a story about me, you don't want to hear about it. Well, I don't like rodents, especially the, I hate the little tail. That's what bothers me the most. Because the hamster does not have a tail, I kind of put up with it, but it's a rodent, okay? At night, you say, it would constantly run on this wheel and wake us up. It was horrible, right? Well, the thing died, and my daughter Hannah was crying. And guess what I did? I cried over a rat. Why? I hate rats. But my daughter was broken, and I cried because I saw it bothered her. Okay? And that's what Jesus does to us. Even though he knows the answers, even though he knows what's going, you're going through, he cares about your heartbeat. He cares about what you care about. And he wants to know that. And so he came to walk, and they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas, which is a very interesting that the Bible would talk about Cleopas. By the way, if you ever have a child a son, name him Cleopas. It's a great name to have. No one else has it. So Cleopas, right? So he talks about Cleopas. And what is this in there for? Because Luke 
gave, uh, uh, interviewed people. And so at the time when the gospel came out, you could find Cleopas and talk to Cleopas about this road he went on. So Cleopas is there, right? And he answered him. He's answering Jesus because Jesus is asking him a question. This is what he says. Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Do you ever feel that way? I'm the only one going through this health crisis. I'm the only one in this relationship conflict. I'm the only one suffering this depression or anxiety or whatever you're going through. I'm the only one. I'm the only one in the world. And often what happens is we have this misnomer that we're the only ones going through it. And this is what they're feeling. What's wrong with you, man? Don't you know what's going on right now? Don't you see my pain right now? They're asking this guy, walking with him how can you not know what's going on the whole city was in an uproar and you're walking with me and you don't know what i'm going through do you ever feel that way alone are you the only one who does not know what's going on things have happened there in these days and he said to them what things he wants to know he wants to hear the heart god wants to hear your heart it's okay to tell god you're going through difficult times like dr franco i'm sure right now is asking god god why that leaves my sister-in-law. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, they're explaining what happened, a man who was a prophet, and wrong. He was not a prophet. You see, they got it wrong. They redefined Jesus because of their circumstances didn't match up to what they thought. There are a lot of people redefining Jesus because it doesn't match up to what culture says or what they're experiencing. We're going to be having a series coming up called Identity to Destiny. In a couple of weeks from now, we're going to look at how you can find your true identity and not live with a false identity. Because identity is so important. And they used to think, they began to think that Jesus was something different. They thought he was a prophet. The Muslims that are going through Ramadan right now, they believe that Jesus is a great prophet, but Muhammad is more important than him. So many people are fine with Jesus being a prophet. So what happened? They redefined Jesus based upon their pain. Have you redefined Jesus based upon your pain? He doesn't care what I'm going through. He doesn't care I'm alone. He doesn't care I'm going through a divorce. He doesn't care that I'm dying. The God of all the universe has left me. We redefine him based on our pain. But all the while, he's closer than you think. And so what happens is we go on, as we look at this story, as we go on, it says this, before God and all the people, we thought as a prophet, mighty indeed, in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him, which, by the way, was outlawed by the Romans 80 years after Christ. But we had hoped, the Bible says in in, in the book of Proverbs, hope deferred. Hope not realized makes the heart sick. Maybe some of your hopes, your heart is sick. God, why am I going through this pain? Why am I going through it? Hope. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. You see, they had an idea in their mind, which I'm going to share in a few moments. They had an idea in their mind that Jesus was going to come one and done. He was going to come. He's going to overthrow the Romans, going to set up a new thing, and the Jewish people are going to rise to the top of the heap, and they're going to rule over the land, the promised land, and right now they're waiting for Messiah to come. And they thought that Jesus is going to make my dreams come true. Who, 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 who? Right? You make my dreams come true. He's going to make you happy. Just sign the dotted line and Christ will give you whatever you want. Isn't that, would not be nice. No, it would not be nice at all. Because you have no idea how to run your life, neither do I. So, we thought this was going to happen. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things have happened. See, back in those days, the Jewish culture, they used to believe that the spirit would hang around for three days after a person died. And then the fourth day would go away. You know why? Because the body begins to stink in the fourth day. I'm not making this up. Amen. So that's just what happened, okay? So what's the significance of Emmaus? Well, there was a guy, 165 B.C., there was a battle called the Battle of Emmaus. You ever hear of Pearl Harbor or Gettysburg? If all I have to say is Gettysburg, you know it's a battle. 
Well, back in the day of Jesus, the Jewish people knew about Emmaus. Oh, yeah, Emmaus. woo -hoo! It was a great time of victory where this guy by the name of Judas Maccabee, isn't that interesting his name is Judas? A military commander. Let me, let me talk about uh, against the Assyrians who were outnumbered. They were outnumbered by the Assyrians. And this is found on Maccabees, which is not part of the scriptures. It's an extra biblical thing that's not had the same value. And so to save time, I'm not going to read it right now to you, but I'll just read this one section. And this is what Judas said, Maccabees. Do not fear their numbers or be afraid when they charge. Remember how our ancestors were saved at the Red Sea when Pharaoh with his forces pursued them. And now let's cry out to heaven to see whether he will, he will favor us and remember his covenant with us and our ancestors and crush this army before us today. Then all the Gentiles will know that there is one who redeems Israel. So you had this Maccabees overthrew the Assyrians. They were conquering by this guy named Judas Maccabees. Now, isn't it interesting that these two guys are walking towards a place where the Jewish people had victory over their oppressors, and they were hoping that Jesus would be someone who would have given victory over the oppression of Rome. But he didn't come through like they thought. Now, I don't think it's an accident that they're going through, going to Emmaus. They're driving towards what they thought was supposed to happen. And as a result, they're not seeing Jesus. Could it be that your eyes are where you think you should be? You can't see that Jesus is alongside of you. And also, moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And what's so amazing is this. If you're going to make up a false religion... You don't put, uh, you don't put, um, you don't put witnesses that are not credible. See, back in the time of Jesus Christ, in the Jewish culture, it was better than most places. A woman's testimony had very little value, in a court of law, it could not be used. So, if you're going to make up a fake religion about Jesus rising from the dead, why would you give as a source of an unreliable source as a woman? Now, that's what they thought. But Jesus, the first person that found Jesus was a woman. Now, how many of you guys are married here today? When you lose something, who's the one that finds it in the house? Your grandma. Okay. <laughs> guy, let me hear the guys say, I mean, show a hand. How many guys, would you, out of your house, and you're, if you're married, when you lose something, who finds it? You, you or your wife? My wife. Absolutely. I can't find anything. In fact, if I lose something, obviously, one time I was sitting here and said, honey, where's my phone? She touches my rear end. like, well, thank you. And I go, oh, that's, oh. She goes, there's your phone. It was right in my pocket. I didn't even realize it. So I've gotten to the point now, I don't even look anymore. I just say, honey, I can't find something. She finds it for me. Leave it to the women to find Jesus and the bonehead man that can't find Jesus, right? Isn't it interesting that Jesus brings redemption and value to women in a culture that did not value them at all? The first person to see Jesus was Mary Magdalene. The first person to be an evangelist was found in John chapter four, the woman at the well, a, a hated Samaritan was one of the first people to spread the gospel. You see, God is a redeemer, and he's closer than you think. And when, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went into the tomb and found it just as the women had said. There was even a historian about 120 A.D. said, you can't trust Christianity because women were the first witnesses. Can you see that, everybody? So, but him they did not see. And he said to them, here's Jesus speaking to them. They didn't know it was Jesus. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Jesus was probably like this. Hey, guys, don't you realize you guys are so hard-headed? What do you mean? Well, let me talk about this Jesus. He begins to speak. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into glory? They're like, really? He starts talking to them. Now listen to this. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, that's what we call the Hebrew Scriptures, which we affectionately call today the Old Testament, all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the Scriptures, the things concerning himself. 
So they drew near to the village. So Jesus was using the old, the Hebrew scriptures to point to him. And if anyone tells you that the Old Testament is not important, then you need to tell that to Jesus. Because the Old Testament points to Jesus, and it talks about him in the very beginning from Genesis to Revelation. You can find Jesus. In fact, my father took six months with a Jewish man who said, I'll believe if you can show me Christ without the New Testament. And my dad showed him all the prophetic scriptures, and by the end of that time, he said, I believe. In fact, you want to be blown away today? Go back and read the end of Isaiah um, 52 and read 53. You'll be blown away by the prophetic picture of what Christ went through. It's talked about 700 years before it even happened. Last week, we talked about the book of Daniel, which I don't have time to tell you today. But the Old Testament shows us Christ. The Old Testament was the, was the Bible of the New Testament church. So if any pastor says we need to unhitch, we need to unhitch ourselves from that pastor. So he acted as if, now what happened here? So they drew near to the village to which they were going, Emmaus. He acted as if he was going to go further. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us. See, back in, the, in that day in the desert culture, hospitality was a big deal in that culture. So please stay with us. Stay with us for it's towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, and he blessed the bread, and he broke it. Now check this out. And he gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Now, why did they recognize Jesus when he broke the bread and blessed it? The reason why I believe is because when he broke the bread, they saw his nail-pierced hands. How can you say that? Well, you ever hear of Thomas? What's Thomas's first name? Doubting Thomas. Can you imagine going to heaven one day? Hey, Tom, hey, oh, are you doubting Thomas? Oh, I'll never live that down. Anyhow, so Thomas said, Thomas said, unless I put my hands in his, this one put my fingers in his hands and his side, I would not believe. And Jesus shows up, says, go ahead, Thomas. So when he broke the bread, they saw his pierced hands and they knew it was him. There's a couple things that are interesting about that. The glorified body that you and I will have one day is Jesus, the prototype that we see there, which is for another time. This is a fascinating thing to look at. They said to each other, two guys, did not our hearts burn within us while you talked to us on the road? Maybe your heart is burning inside of you today. You don't know why you've been tearing up. You don't know why you feel this, almost like God's wooing you to himself. It's the burning, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. It's not my talk. You, I can, you know, it's not about that. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. God is calling you. He wants you to draw close. Maybe you've given up on Jesus. Maybe you have redefined Jesus as someone who's indifferent to your pain. I want to let you know he's closer than you think. He's right by you right now, and he loves you, and he wants to know you. And so he opened to us the scriptures. You want to know Jesus. If you're falling away from God, I encourage you to get into the scriptures. The scriptures are him. This is the scriptures. The Bible says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. There's power in the scriptures of Jesus Christ. And so what happens is this is what's taking place. He says, and they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared even to Simon. That's Peter. Then they told what had happened on the road and how it was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, what's that all about? Jesus was a sacrificial lamb that broke for us. What happened was this, everybody. You guys hear about these reports, right? I told you about that accident that took place in the beginning of our time here today. It's unjust that somebody would smash someone in the back and kill them as a result of that car accident. It doesn't seem fair. When you hear about an elderly person being abused or a child abused, something rises up in us. That's not right. There's got to be justice, right? Right now we're living in a culture that's canceling. You make one mistake, you're canceled. Why? Because everyone understands that there has to be payment for the things done wrong. All of us know that. Why? Because God's the God of justice, and that justice is in your DNA. And you're crying out. You know things aren't right. Sin simply means missing the mark. All of us are missing the mark. We know there's something fundamentally wrong. So let me find something wrong with you so I don't have to deal with myself. That's what we often do. And if, if, why do we get angry? Why do we want justice? Because there must be justice. And God knew that. And the only, only, only way to satisfy God's love is by punishment. And the only one that could fulfill that was Jesus Christ. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for us. 
You're not good enough. I'm not good enough. We've a, we're a lost cause. So Jesus became sin for us. Jesus even quoted on the cross, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because Jesus was forsaken. You never have to be forsaken if you put your faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you in a few moments to make a decision towards him. The Bible says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but to save the world. You see, God loves you so much, he was willing to put his son on the line. I heard a story a number of years ago about a, a bridge operator, one of those bridges, the drawbridge operator for a train track. It was over a river. And his five-year-old son used to love to go with his father and sit in the tower and watch the boats go by. And they'd open the drawbridge up, the boats would go by. Then he'd drop the drawbridge and the train would go by. He'd love hanging out with his dad, bring his lunch and hang out with him. And one day he was there with his father and all of a sudden they got a report that a train messed up and the train was coming down the track and the drawbridge was still open. A boat just passed by and he saw the train coming. He said, what am I going to do? I better close the thing. He said, where's my son? And he looked and he saw his son playing within the gears of the bridge. And he had a choice at that moment. Do I lower the bridge and kill my son? Or do I, lower, do I leave the bridge open and let the train perish with hundreds of people? And so the train operator, the father, saw his son and saw the people coming. And he pushed the button. And his son was crushed and killed to save the train the people on that train. Jesus came and took our place because we were plunging to our death. We were on a collision course with hell and Jesus took our place. God lowered the bridge upon him that if you can pass through Jesus, oh, only through Christ are you saved. He's the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. No one comes to the Father except through him, not through Buddhism, not through Islam. Oh, how can you say that? Because Jesus says, I'm the only way. Everyone's going to have to pass through Jesus. The only assurance of salvation is in Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Maybe some of you have never given your life to Christ. Maybe you're a Christian, but you never gave your life to Christ. Today is the day of salvation. And what he asks you to simply do is this. You can't save yourself. Christ saved, saved you. If you'll pray this prayer, if you believe that he died on the cross and rose again from the dead, and be willing to lay down your life and give up ownership of your life and give it to him, you can become saved today. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. If you want to join me in that prayer, pray this in your heart. If you've fallen away or you've never done it, today's the day. Lord Jesus, that's right. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. Go ahead and pray that. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and paid for my sins. I ask you now to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And today, I choose to step down from being in charge of my life. I declare you are God and I am not. Amen.